Welcome to this session on performance culture. I am Paul on the left there. I work on Google's developer relations team, where I spend my time looking at uh, performance, design, and UX, and normally where the three of those meet. And I am Alaris Swanson. I work at Etsy, and I'm the engineering manager for the performance team. We help all of the feature teams who are building products or features or experiments make sure that whatever they're shipping is as fast as humanly possible. All right, so I guess the opening question is, why are we even talking about performance cultures? And why does this session even exist? And I think to answer that, we need to understand a little bit about where our industry is and, and what we're sort of seeing and where we think it's going to go. And it's really about this, uh, the multi-device web. We've seen more devices than ever before come online. And I think really the one that stands out for me the most and is this one. It's the smartphone. It's the, it sort of represents the most performance-constrained device that we have. Uh, whether that's in terms of the screen size, or the GPU, the CPU, or its connection to the network. And the thing is, more and more people are using smartphones. In fact, one study suggests that just over a third of American adults use their smartphone as their primary means of accessing the internet, which means for those people, uh, their first experience of you, your site, your brand, is going to be through their smartphone. And that's something that we need to be uh, thinking through. In fact, it's not just in the States, it's also uh, globally. So here we have the percentage of total global internet traffic according to StatCounter. And you can see that the trend is pretty clear upwards. Um, and it looks, I think, sort of the middle of next year, if, if the trend line is correct, that we'll cross that 50% marker. So the thing about this is... Mobile networks can add a tremendous amount of latency. So before a mobile device can transmit or receive data, it has to establish a radio channel with the network. And this can take several seconds over a 3G connection. So after the device talks to a radio tower to negotiate when it can transmit data, the network carrier then must transmit that data to its internal network and then to the public internet. So the combination of these steps can, can add up to tens to thousands of milliseconds of extra latency. So the most <laughs> important question I hear when I say this is, well, what about 4G? 4G is awesome, right? Our networks are improving. But you have to remember, the new device and fast network with an excellent connection that you have in your pocket right now is not a good representation of what your end users are really experiencing. So while it's true that networks are getting better, you need to remember that your users are on a variety of connections with various levels of connectivity and latency. It's also important to remember that if your site is slow, people will go elsewhere. In fact, one study suggests that as many as 40% of people will leave a site when it takes longer than three seconds to load. So we have some options. In the face of this stuff that's a little bit scary, what can we do about it? The first option is to ignore it. You can certainly say, you know what, we just saw those awesome stats. We say that we're, we're actually, you know, we're trying, but we don't, we don't think it's that important. Maybe mobile isn't the future. Maybe that trend line's going to lie to us. Maybe networks will be better immediately. Uh, I don't think that this is true. No, I, I tend to think, um, no. I, I think that we can't just ignore it. Can, can we, I'd like to. Yeah, it'd be really cool. But I, I think that the no. other option is to assign performance cops, right? Like, yeah. who in here would identify as a performance cop or janitor within their organization? Any, anybody ever somebody, been one of those? Yeah, somebody who comes in afterwards, Look cleans up. Look at these up. Yeah, Look at this. Yes, that's me. I don't know. <laughs> So performance cops, right? We, we come in and we say, hey, designer, hey, developer, here's some better ways you can do this. You come in cleaning up after people. You try to make your site better, but the, the responsibility solely rests on you. And this can often lead to a tremendous amount of burnout. And frankly, it's not sustainable. There's always going to be new people joining your organization. Your site will continue to get slower. It'll continue to be iterated upon. The hardware will age. Being a performance cop is not a sustainable thing. So that's why we're here to talk about building performance cultures. Wow, I wonder which one we'll choose from that list. <laughs> um, so we're all set to build a performance culture, super. But we have to ask the question, well, what do we even mean by a culture? Well, I guess you could come up with your own definitions. Goodness knows there'll probably be a bunch of them that you could think up. But for us today, at least, in this conversation, here's the things that we actually have in mind. Firstly, it's a way of saying, I belong to this group. I get them. Hopefully, they get me. I understand this particular group. So for example, being British, 
I would identify with British culture. You're which British? Is, I know, right? It's a relief for anybody in the room going, where is he from? His American accent is really strange. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so it's that, it's that first and foremost, it's just saying, yeah, this, this is my kind of people. Uh, it's also about how you think and how you reason and rationalize the world around you and the kind of social cues that you look for or the slightly strange obsession with green liquids you <laughs> may or may not have. Um, but it's that, it's that sense of the world around you. Um, it's also how you do things, uh, whether that's the side of the road you drive on, maybe the wrong side, um, <laughs> the words that you use for things, or uh, perhaps in our case, how we go about crafting the code. And then lastly, it's how you celebrate things, the things that are important to you, the things that you celebrate, and how you go about celebrating it is unique to your culture. And we see cultures at the, the highest level internationally, nationally, all the way down to our homes and, and so forth, and actually, of course, our workplaces, which brings us back to that whole performance culture thing. Yeah, we were joking uh, when we were talking about this earlier that performance cultures are kind of a team sport. Uh, it's important to remember that everybody has to play. And as you say about sports, there is no I in performance. That is true. But if you're willing to look hard enough, you will find there is prance for me. <laughs> you can stop the slide now. All right, all right. So thank you for that. Uh, so culture change is scary, and it's hard. And I can understand, especially for those of us in this room, we don't know necessarily how to approach it. How do we start to create or enact performance culture within our environments? I'm going to go through some real things that have been said to me as I've gone on this journey within organizations I've worked in. Laura, I don't want to think about mobile. Right? So, who's, so who's heard that? Whiny. Yeah. Uh, Laura, I'm a, I'm a project manager, a product manager, and I've looked at the deadlines. I've got some resources, and frankly, building for both desktop and mobile is going to take twice as long. It's a lie. Laura, you are the performance manager. Don't you know responsive web design is inherently bad for performance? Or, my personal favorite, everything changes too fast. <laughs> so here's the thing. We've been through this before. And as, when it comes to web development, We've gone through these kinds of changes in the past. Who here has built <laughs> sites with tables for layout? Yes. Yes. Look at all these guilty hands. <laughs> yes. I, I don't we do remember it anymore. the pain. So, at probably every job I worked at between 2006 and 2010, I remember these arguments. Do we have to move to a CSS-based layout? In fact, we did. We did it pretty successfully. This is more like what we would use today. And this is actually set to change again with web components. Who has heard this from a very important person? Excuse me, the important part is not above the fold. We need users to have to scroll to see content. Yeah. This is again what we're seeing today. We used to worry about 800 by 600 pixel monitors. Now we're worrying about a spectrum of screen sizes. Uh, this graphic represents all the devices that come to Etsy.com that have more than 1 million visits per month in traffic. We're no longer seeing just handsets and tablets and desktops. We're seeing a spectrum of screen sizes. You may also think about how we've changed developing for different browsers over time. I remember back in the day, we were talking about cross-browser comp compatibility or making things look the same across browsers. Browser, uh, browser hacks, prefixes, et cetera. And this is, again, what we're saying, seeing today. We have to start thinking about mobile web browsers in addition to just our desktop clients. But this is all to say that change is scary, but it's also constant in our industry, and it's good. This is a good part of our jobs. We've lost crazy table layouts, and now we have semantic markup. And more people than ever before can use our sites and our apps. This is good for, for us as developers, and it's really good for our users. So we, we need to embrace change. Good, fine. Uh, so where do we start when we want, actually want to create one of these performance cultures? Well, the first step for us is to actually gather some data, because essentially, you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you are. And you need to understand how real people use your site. Like, what devices are they on? Where are they in the world? What journey do they take through your site? Um, which pages do they arrive on? Which ones do they leave on? And you need to understand your own situation. You know? And if you don't know today, you can't start telling that story to the people around you and get them on board to build this culture with you. 
So the immediate thing that springs to mind is just go and have a look at your analytics. Go and look at Google Analytics, figure out what it's telling you, spend a bit of time, make some reports, and start to get that sense of where you're at. Um, the next thing you want to do is actually look at your load stats. So how long does it take to load it? How long does it feel like it takes to load your site? Again, it's, this is coming down to the, the data that you can share, but it's also, in this case, coming down to a little bit of empathy as well. How does it actually feel to be one of those people that's using your site on a day-to-day -day basis from somewhere else in the world? And for that, we can turn to web page test. And you can ask it to load your site from a range of locations, a bunch of devices, and different connection types. And it's going to give you a load of really useful, really amazing data. And one feature I particularly like is the ability to compare pages. So you could take, for example, your own site and, oh, I don't know, the site of your co-presenter and see who's fastest. Matt Colbro. Oh, yeah. Um, I actually did that, <laughs> as you can see. And um, depressingly, it's a draw. <laughs> so, yeah. Could have been bad, um, but it wasn't. But the, I'm, still, I'm sure you can start to see how you could start figuring out you know, the story here. Like, how does it feel to be one of our users when you compare it to somebody else in the world? Or da 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 da, -da. You get this idea, OK? So you start getting this insight. And you don't even have to leave your desk. That's the best bit. Um, but we can get even more data at web page test. And we can share that with our team. Uh, like, how long does it take before our server sends some data back? Or how long before our pages start rendering? Um, but one number I want to call out is this, which is the speed index. Um, it's, a bit, it's a bit weird, the way it's calculated. You can click on it. There's a link. Uh, and you can click on it, and it'll tell you in all the gory detail how it, it figures it out. And it's pretty cool. It's magic. It is magic. But it is a really good number uh, for figuring out uh, in milliseconds how long it feels like it takes for your page to load. Uh, so that's you know a really good measurement, better than, say, on the onload uh, event. But speaking of perceived performance, uh, we don't just want to stop caring when people you know, when they've landed on the site and we go, oh, what have we done? We need to care about scrolling and animations and interactions. And they all need to be this silky smooth 60 frames a second because people care about that. They want that, that feel of, of responsiveness and smoothness. And again, you could go to something like DevTools uh, to look at your page's frame data and figure out what your frames per second is like. So you get frames per second. Uh, we can dive into uh, the frames a little bit there and find out where we've got issues, and then start fixing them. Now, if all that's new to you, uh, it's time for a shameless plug, which is to say I've got a session tomorrow morning that will uh, tell you exactly what you need to know about these tools, the tools you need to succeed. Um, it rhymes. It's true. Um, so come to that if you're interested. Anyway, so hopefully at the end of this situation, we have a load of information, we have a load of data, and we're starting to hopefully build this story in our, in our heads of what it feels like to be one of our users. So you've got this data, and you're excited about it. What do you do with all of that excitement and all of that data? You should go talk to some very important people. You want to enlist the help of the very important people at your company and get them to understand what your users are feeling and experiencing. There are a few things more powerful than getting a very important person to say, this is important. Performance is important. It's crucial to getting others at your company invested in performance. So what can you do to make this happen? Here's an idea that we came up with. You should send your very important person one stat a day for two weeks and see how long it takes before they cave or just get really annoyed with you. One that we often like to cite is this Google study that found an additional 200 milliseconds of delay triggered a 0.3% loss in engagement. You may say to yourself, 0.3% is like not a lot, but Google is pretty popular, so any kind of loss of engagement is going to have a huge effect. Or remember that old, that old stat that we just had where 40% of people will leave a site that takes longer than three seconds to load? Tell your very important person that stat and say, and by the way, ours takes five seconds to load on a 3G connection. So after the stat thing has run its course, consider running some experiments. Measure the business impact of these experiments. Know what kinds of metrics your very important person cares about. Maybe it's bounce rate. Maybe it's conversion rate. Maybe it's something else. Go ahead and run performance experiments and see what the effects are. On Etsy, we ran an experiment in which we added 160 kilobytes of page weight to a page on a mobile device. And we saw that it increased mobile bounce rates by 12%. This is the kind of thing that we can share with the folks at Etsy and say, hey, this stuff is important. Look at the effects that it has. However, this is kind of a negative stat, and I kind of prefer to make it positive. 
So what we found when we eliminated jank, that's that scrolling issue, when we eliminated jank on, the, on Etsy's activity feed, we saw people favorite more often and favorite more items. And this is another kind of experiment that you could run. Make something better and measure the effects before and after and pick and choose the engage, engagement metrics that you know your very important person is going to care about. You could also use that web page test film strip, thanks for that. You're welcome. And take the video output and compare that before and the after of the experiment. Make an improvement. Show how slow it was before and show how, long, how short it took afterwards and get that person to care and feel about how this works. Or compare your site on desktop to how it loads on mobile. Or compare your site in the United States to how it loads globally. Get your very important person to see and to feel these things so that they actually care about this stuff too. You want to get them to feel it. Once they understand, you can help them empower others. By changing how your very important people think about performance, it will help everybody who surrounds you, PMs, designers, developers, care and work on performance. Speaking about those other people, um, so we've got data. Uh, we've got our VIPs to say, OK, performance is important. We see that it's got real value. How do we then make it so that the people around us can actually start actually taking this you know, and, and using it. Well, uh, the easiest way uh, is to educate them through something like a, a brown bag lunch and learn session on all the tools, all the data, all the things that you've figured out um, about how you're actually doing. And it's not, as we said, it's not just developers. It's, it's designers, it's UX, it's project managers, it's anyone who's involved in what you do. Because it's a team sport, and we want to make sure that the people that we're working with know the impact of the decisions that they take. So it's not just a case of, well, the developers have done all they can, but actually the problem is originating from another place. You know, if, you, if you include everybody, you've got a much better chance of success. The next thing that's well worth doing is to start documenting your best practices and writing things up. Because what it is, it gives you is an easily copy-pastable uh, setup that you have. It makes it uh, sort of more obvious about how to do the right things as far as you're concerned. Anybody who joins your company is going to start figuring out, oh, this is how I'm supposed to do things, rather than you know, just having to guess and, and muddle their way through. And you can, you can sort of use it to show what worked and what didn't work. And if nothing else, it kind of gives everybody a, a focal point and say, right, this is, you know, because you'll find there will be trade-offs in everything you do. This thing and th doing it this way works for us because of this. So it's a really good place to sort of, um, it's really good to start writing these things down. Another thing that is definitely worth doing is seeing what your users are seeing, uh, which is to say, invest in a device lab. And I mentioned this to somebody the other day, and they went, $10,000? Really? Because uh, that was what they were assuming it was going to cost. Well, first of all, it doesn't necessarily have to cost that much. Secondarily, um, you know, the, the cost of not testing across multiple devices may be way higher. And so that's something that you want to you know, decide for yourselves. But anyway, it's a sort of, it's an out of sight, out of mind kind of problem, this one. Um, if you put these devices in front of everybody, it kind of gives everyone a, that reminder that there's, there's this whole range of devices that they, they should be testing on and that they are building for the multi-device web. And they need to care about performance on all of them. Um, it's also a social place as well. So people can meet and gather around these devices and start to figure out together how you can solve particular problems. And again, that will broaden the horizons beyond just the developers. Uh, one thing that is pretty cool out in the design sandbox, if you haven't seen it, we have a device lab. And the team there will talk to you about how you can go about making your own device lab. The source apparently is on GitHub um, because it does some crazy stuff where it pushes to all the devices at the same time, which is really cool. So go and see the, the design sandbox people. They will help you. And then also, if you go to laraswanson.com slash device lab, you can see all the slides that I just gave for a tutorial on how to build your own device lab, how to choose devices, how to troubleshoot power, and all of the other things that we learned along the way. Awesome. All right, so you, it's great to have the device lab, but it's not great if you don't use it. It's a bit like having a gym membership and then never getting on a treadmill. Yeah. So make time to actually test your stuff for real. Uh, it's, it's good. You've hopefully got the VIPs to say it's important. So you can say, actually, you know, we need time now to make sure that things are working well. So go and give your device a big old hug. Let them know you love them. You know? um, like we said earlier, though, it's, 
educating your team isn't just about developers, and performance isn't just an internal thing. Some of it, sorry, it's just not an external thing. It's also internal. Get that the right way around. <laughs> um, it's about everyone who builds for the web in your company. And that means, in a lot of ways, that you want to eliminate duplicate code. You want to basically embrace responsive. Um, instead of having like a mobile team that does the M dot and you know, the other team that does all the other stuff, M dot. What do you do for like TV? Do you do TV dot? What do you do for refrigerators? F, F dot. R dot? Uh, oh. Don't, do, don't do, do that. No, don't do that. Don't do that that seems like it's not going to scale well. No. <laughs> OK. They, they, you were saying earlier they do taxis. Oh, yeah, taxis in New York have, have a little, you can access the Mind <laughs> blown. <laughs> All right. Um, point here is you're going to eliminate duplicate code. You're going to make it easier uh, for your team to iterate more quickly, hopefully. And it, it starts to break down the barriers between you, the designers, the developers. And it just gives you a gr much greater chance of success. So in summary, when you've got the green light from your VIP, start teaching your team about performance and the impact of their work. It's going to empower them. Sorted. <laughs> so you need to start servicing performance within people's daily lives. We can talk about performance all day, about how important it is. And when you ship something new, you can see at the end of the day how much performance was impacted negatively or positively. But this doesn't help people as they're designing or developing. So the first thing you can do is add performance to your build tools. Automate image compression. Get a command line tool running, like Grunt or Gulp, that runs performance tests and compares your new work to your performance budget. You could use something like Travis to do this in a continuous integration environment. And these tools can even report back to dashboards, which is my next recommendation. So at Etsy, we look at something like this every time we deploy code, which happens upwards of 50 times a day. When someone deploys something new, they'll go over to a dashboard and say, how did this impact performance? It's really important that as people are continually pushing out new work, they can see immediately how their stuff has affected it. But also at Etsy, we have this toolbar that sits at the top of every page of Etsy.com if you're logged in as an Etsy employee. And in this, we've got information about visitor traffic and experiments, but we also have performance data. So we surface the timings for people as they're developing in, de in developing, staging, and production environments. And then we also have a clear baseline for what's acceptable. We'll let you know if you're violating one of our performance service level agreements. By surfacing your team's performance data during the workflow, it'll help improve their work. It'll become baked into their workflow. They'll start to care about it because they can see how their work directly impacts it as they're designing and developing. And this brings me to our last point. This stuff is going to make people so excited. And people are going to ship things that are improvements to your site. You should be celebrating everything. Again, I'm all about the excitement. I'm all about like, getting people pumped up about uh, performance. Yeah. Prepping the talk with Lara was like a, 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 an object lesson in excitement. <laughs> nice. yeah. So for me, this is actually the most important part. Back in the day, in August of 2011, the man behind the sunglasses, Seth Walker, published Etsy's first performance report. He published it on Etsy's new blog, news blog, so it was super public. He chose a bunch of baseline business metrics, or uh, page load time metrics, rather, and he showed how long our, our major pages were uh, taking a load. And you can see there's a huge outlier here, the home page. It was embarrassing, but he published it anyway, because this stuff isn't a secret. But what's amazing about this is that developers teamed up to fix this. As soon as we published it, as soon as Seth put that into the world, people got excited about it, and they wanted to help, and they wanted to fix it. And by the next time we published reports, which was in November of 2011, it was a huge improvement. Not only did the home page significantly improve in page load time, but it was the, with the fastest one on this list. So you should be sharing your findings. Make sure that you're celebrating externally the stuff that you're doing to help improve things along the way. But also, as Paul mentioned, it's important to do this internally as well. This is an example dashboard that we have, the Performance Hero dashboard, in which we celebrate engineers and designers who make huge improvements to Etsy's page load time, and they're not on the performance team. In this case, Chris Fairbanks, who's on the checkout team, eliminated a ton of duplicate code and had what we call a Baumgartner. Remember that guy who jumped out of a hot air balloon and landed on Earth? Yeah, so every time we have a no, graph like this. So it wasn't a dance move, right? It was a dance, no, it wasn't a dance move. It was a plummet to the Earth. <laughs> every time we have one of these, a Baumgartner, we celebrate this internally. We put this up on a dashboard, and we have that little printout sign, and we hang out with them, and we're like, thanks, thanks, buddy. And we want to celebrate these things internally. Lots of high fives, lots of donuts, lots of cake. You should be rewarding your innovators. It's not just about coming down with a hammer. It's not about being a cop or a janitor. 
This is really about celebrating improvements and getting people excited and invested in performance. Celebrating wins will motivate your team to be performance champions. So to summarize, gather the data. You want to make sure that you have a baseline of understanding how your users feel. Again, this is all about understanding the overall user experience. It's the aesthetics and it's page load time. You then want to share all of that stuff with your VIPs. Get them to understand what your users are really experiencing. Get them to understand what it's like on mobile and globally. Get them to understand also how this stuff impacts the business metrics. Run some experiments and share that data with them. Once you get a very important person to say this is important, or just if you find it's awesome enough to say this is important, educate your team. Do the, those brown bags and lunch and learns. Make sure that you're surfacing that data in their daily workflows. Make sure also, oh, uh, 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 so close, you're celebrating things. Again, this is a journey, right? You may be at any step in this process, and you may have to start again gathering more data, getting more VIP buy-in, educating the team again. New designers and developers will join. You'll have to do more brown bag lunch and learns. New technologies will emerge, and you'll want to share that data and that new information with them. You'll find new wins, and you want to celebrate that stuff. This is a continually journey and a continually positive process. OK, so as we said at the start, we're, we're in this period of dramatic change where we're seeing mobile traffic go whoosh, straight up. And we're, we're facing this world where, essentially, we need to deal with these performance-constrained devices. Like building for this tomorrow that we're looking at involves facing that fact and saying, you know what, most of the devices that, uh, that people are going to be using are not desktop. They are not powerful devices. The thing is, it's not really tomorrow. It's kind of now. And that's the thing about dealing with performances. It really starts and it can and should start today. But the only way you're going to get to that point is if absolutely everybody in your organization from the top to the bottom cares deeply about performance and its impact. And the only way you're going to get there is if you start building performance cultures. Thank you. Um, we'd love your feedback. Uh, please do snap the code or take down the URL. And we'll be outside if you want to uh, ask any questions and say hi. Come hang out. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.